Greetings. Shabbat Shalom. This is the Sabbath that Jews call Shabbat HaGadol, the Great Sabbath, the Sabbath before the Festival of Unleavened Bread. But I'm speaking at a at a very in, very serious time in the history of uh, my country and in the history of the world. You know, in the book of Hezekiah, I'm sorry, <laughs> in the book of Second Chronicles, there is no book of Hezekiah, but in the, in a, in the book of Second Chronicles about Hezekiah, uh, it talks about the fact that during his time there was a great festival of unleavened bread and the people decided let's keep another seven days. Well, we have, we're going to have a similar situation away this year. A lot of you after the festival of unleavened bread, you're not going to go back to your normal routine. You're going to be pretty much um, in some sense, you know, not doing your normal work for at least another week after that in many cases, but uh, not for the same reason as the people in Hezekiah's day. So we hope and pray that all of you who are listening to me now are well, and as you, those of you listening later on, you know, that you will be well and, and that you will uh, stay well. We have, this is the 10th day of the first month on the sacred calendar. So very soon, we're going to have the New Testament Passover ceremony, the Lord's Supper. And we reflect upon the fact that God became human, went through all of the experiences of human life, and then suffered terribly. And, you know, the book of Romans says that um, in the fifth chapter, um, for scarce, in, in the seventh verse, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. But we also know that he was resurrected and that he is our living Savior. Verse 10 of that same uh, chapter. Uh, for if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. This is a time for us to, in a way, come back to the basics, come back to uh, renew our relationship with God. Uh, at this time of the year, uh, Linda and I have our wedding anniversary. In a way, this is a time for the church to uh, recapture, you might say, the romance between the bride of Christ and the coming groom. You know, he's coming back to uh, to consummate the marriage. I want to review familiar scriptures today that I believe ought to be reviewed at this time of the year. I'll call it a seasonal review of familiar scriptures. A seasonal review of familiar scriptures. Before our Savior died, seven sayings are attributed to him in the Gospel accounts, which bring out important themes of Christianity, of God's truth. I want to go to Luke 23 and verse 34. Well, no, a little bit later than that. Um, I was I was in the wrong uh, chapter. That's why I I said what I did. Actually, it's uh, going to work out all, all right where uh, where I am. I want to go to Luke uh, twenty three and and verse thirty four. Now I'm in the correct chapter, and maybe you're there with me. Uh, then Jesus said, "Now he's being crucified." Now, he died at 3 o'clock in the afternoon on the 14th day of the first month, which is when they killed the Passover lamb. He is our Passover. Check out 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8. And we remember his death on the anniversary of his death, which is the 14th day of the first month. Go back in the history of the church, you'll find there were people called Quarto Decimans. They commemorated the 14th day of the first month on the Hebrew calendar as we do maybe not in the same way but it's you know but they did remember the 14th day of Nisan 
uh, and in, Hebrew, in ancient times it was called Aviv, which is now the name given to the whole spring season. I want to go to Luke 23 and verse 34. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And then it goes on to say, and they divided his garments and cast lots. Uh, this is the fulfillment of a prophecy. I believe you find it in Psalm 22. And all through the Gospels, you find prophecies fulfilled. There may be as many as 353 verses associated with the, with the uh, life and ministry of Jesus Christ that you find in, in the Gospel accounts and, and elsewhere in, in, in the New Testament. There, there may be as many as 353 prophecies or, or scriptures that could be associated with, with what he did and said and so forth. And uh, here you have an example of a fulfilled prophecy. And even while dying, he reminded us that he was fulfilling prophecy. So he knew all along what would happen and why. And of course, he prayed about it. Is there another way? And he realized there was no other way. Not your, you know, my will, but your will be done. As a man, he prayed to God. And uh, the answer was that God's will supersedes our will and so and therefore uh, god's will superseded even the even the desire of, of 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 jesus christ the human being to could it could some other way be found no so he willingly went and did what he had to do and uh he's he, what he went through was horrific as we know he did it for each of us and and yet a, as he was being punished he said father forgive them for they know not what they do so forgiveness is obviously a key element in in salvation forgiveness but now we can go on and talk about salvation uh, he was uh, crucified uh, among thieves he had thieves on either side of him which again was a fulfillment of prophecy and in uh, in uh, verse 39 of uh, you know remember Isaiah 53 had a lot to say uh, prophetically about Jesus Christ anyway verse 39 then one of the criminals who were ha who were hanged blasphemed him saying if you are the Christ or if you are the Messiah, save yourself and us. So evidently his attitude was a very uh, cynical one. But the other answering rebuked him saying, Do you not even fear God seeing you are under the, the same condemnation? So one gets the idea that maybe somehow he was not the most enthusiastic thief or somewhere along the line came to understand the gravity of what he did. And uh, what he says here is shocking because let's say he stole a very valuable item, but is crucifixion an appropriate punishment for that? But yet he was willing to, 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 to say, you know, it reminds me of the song uh, where somebody had, had committed a murder and he's in Folsom prison. And so he says, I knew, I know, I know I had it coming. I know I can't be free. All right, but he was a murderer, and even he wasn't crucified in the song. Uh, and here's a man who, who was a thief and crucified, and yet he says, uh, and we indeed justly, 41, he, he's, we're being punished fairly because we were, we were uh, guilty. And we indeed justly, for we receive due reward for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, Jesus Christ discerned his attitude, and you, therefore this man did not have to be baptized or, ha or hands laid on him. You know, those are procedures that under normal circumstances ought to happen, but Jesus Christ discerned his attitude, and evidently uh, this man became a part of God's church at that time. Then Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, he didn't have time to go into a long exposition about life and death and the resurrections and all of that. Uh, the, the next waking memory of that man will be in the kingdom of God. And then, then we can get into the finer points, you know, the technicalities. Uh, but this next waking moment, uh, after, uh, well, after his death, I mean, he was still alive here, but, at, but after his death, the next waking moment will be in the kingdom of God. And so then uh, at that point... Uh, He'll understand, you know, he'll understand what Jesus didn't have time or energy to explain to him there. So we have two important uh, statements of Jesus Christ before his death. One is regarding forgiveness and one is regarding salvation. You know, they certainly 
uh, go to go together and then we have Christian living because once we uh, have forgiveness and we have the the gift of of salvation if we if we stick with it if we endure uh, until the end then we have the next step which is um, which is Christian living and that involves relationships we have the Ten Commandments, which talk about the duties of man towards God, of human beings towards God, and the duties of human beings towards their fellow human beings. And Christian living is about that because Jesus said, you know, what you want, what you would have, what you would uh, ha have people to do to you, do also to them. The golden rule was the summary of the law and the prophets, Matthew seven twelve. So here we go to John nineteen and verse twenty six, and we have. A, we have a third statement. Uh, now, therefore, now there's now this is John 19. I'll go to verse 25. Now, there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, uh, and uh, Mary Magdalene. So we have his mother, his mother's sister, and then we have Mary, the wife of, Cleo, of Clopas. We have Mary there. We, uh, we have her... her his, her sister there. We have the uh, wife of Clopas there, and we have Mary Magdalene there. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, and uh, we understand that that's John. Yohanan, the eternal has been gracious. That's what his name means, John. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Now, there could be reasons why he chose John to take care of her rather than one of his own uh, one, one of his own brothers, half brothers through Mary. He made the choice that she should stay with John. That would, could be the subject for another discussion. But he saw her with John. Uh, he saw John there, uh, and, and well, first he saw her. Well, no, he saw the disciple that whom he loved standing by. So he said to her, "Woman, behold your son." verse 27 then he said to the disciple behold your mother and from that hour that disciple took her uh, to his own home now uh, there's evidently been some historical speculation about where the 12 apostles went and uh, I haven't reviewed it lately but evidently there's some material indicating the possibility that John went all the way at one time uh, to Gaul what is today France and had Mary with him. But in any case, you know that um, he finally wound up uh, in his life in, in what is today Asia Minor. He was in Ephesus. He was on the Isle of Patmos uh, in, in some kind of incarceration and so forth. By that time, she very likely was, was no longer alive. But uh, he, she was with him. It says here that, and from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. So he was even as dying, concerned about who would take care of his mother, and he chose the best possible for person for it. And, and as I said, even one who was not his own, her own son, but one who would become uh, a son uh, in this way, by taking care of her that way. So we have yet another statement of Jesus Christ, this one about relationships, this one about Christian living, about love of one human being for another. Each human being, of course, is made in the image of God. If we love God, we're going to love our fellow human beings. Now we come, we, I want to go to the book of Matthew, to the 27th chapter. Since these are the last sayings before his, his death, they, they, are, uh, they have become important in, uh, in theology. And I imagine many a sermon has been given and many a book written about these seven sayings. Uh, in uh, the 46th verse of uh, Matthew 27 uh, and about the ninth hour so this is three o'clock uh, you know this is when the lamb would, would would be killed on the 14th day of the first month and about the ninth hour Jesus Christ and by the way um, we keep the Passover at the beginning of the 14th and that's appropriate uh, for for reasons I won't get into a lot right now uh, it's appropriate to be to, to keep it not at three o'clock uh, on the 14th, but in the evening on the beginning of the 14th. 
And uh, so this year, um, that will be coming up, what, uh, Tuesday night? Um, I believe so. Uh, so uh, April 7th, uh, right? The night of April 7th. Um, so uh, I believe that's correct. And if you know, Linda will correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and so we are going to have a Passover service recorded for those of you who would find it beneficial to actually, as you're participating perhaps in your home in a Passover service, to actually have a service conducted electronically. Uh, we're, we're going to have, uh, we have, of course, in our archives, we have, we have from the past, but we want to do one this year, and each year I revise, revise it somewhat. I hope this year I have it the way we want to keep it. You know, I talk to my family about whether I should do more of an off-the-cuff, uh, so to speak, uh, extemporaneous Passover, or if we should have a fixed liturgy. And the, 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 the consensus seemed to be that for that particular night, the, the night of uh, the Lord's Supper, there should be a fixed liturgy. So I, I hope that the one we have this year will be pretty much one that, that we can keep. Uh, but we're going to record a, a, a Passover service, New Testament Passover service, what some people call communion, some call Eucharist. First Corinthians 11 speaks of the Lord's Supper. And uh, we, we will have it available, I think, by about a quarter to 9 p.m. or so. Let's say by 9 p.m. Eastern Time, it will be available, which means those of you in the Midwest and those of you out West can have it at your convenience available to you. And those of you who, uh, or, or even, you know, the Rocky Mountain area, the, you know, the Southwest, any of those areas, uh, it will be work out very conveniently. Now, those of you who are on the East Coast, um, you would have it available to you at 9 p.m., uh, but you're pretty much stuck in your home anyway, so it shouldn't be a problem to do it at 9 p.m. And frankly, there isn't a reason to do it er er early necessarily that evening. 9 p.m. Is, is, is an appropriate time to do it, and I, I can also get into that at another time. Uh, but uh, anyway, it would be available by then for those on the East Coast, and then of course uh, the other time zones can have it when, whenever it, you know the it is time for, uh, wherever they are. Uh, so we do plan to do that. We also, I also plan to give a message on the Holy Day, the first day of unleavened bread, and I plan to give a message on the seventh day of unleavened bread. And frankly, I want to give a message for each day of the festival. So we'll see how. Uh, you know what kind of response we have but you know uh, m most people are stuck in their homes and um, frankly so are we here in uh, in central florida in osceola county so m my wife suggested do what we do during the festival of tabernacles have messages all through the festival of unleavened bread uh, when i w i used I, when i was a student in college at, at a college that was biblically based there was a time when we had Bible studies, I think, every evening during that during that period. You know, we, we didn't have class, so we worked by day and went to Bible study by night. And uh, so anyway, I plan to have, God willing, um, a message for each of those uh, days of unleavened bread in between. What we call in Hebrew, Chol Hamawed, the days that are not holy days, but part of the festival. Now, I want to also mention the Flair Church. Uh, the Passover service we do will be uh, in line with with uh, Daniel's production, productions that he does, the Flair Church, so he will have Facebook announcements on it, and the Flair Church will, will do a complete service. I do a, a message, the Flair Church does a complete service, and uh, the Flair Church will do a service on the first day of Unleavened Bread and on the seventh day of Unleavened Bread, so you can check with... Uh, yeah, Facebook, the Flair Church Facebook page for, for, for that information. We had a service this morning, and I hope some of you were able to uh, watch it or will be able to watch it. So now I want to come to Matthew 27 and verse 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Uh, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In other words, again, Bible prophecy. He reminds us of Psalm 22. And uh, there's positive to Psalm 22 as well. It goes through the agony of the crucifixion. But at the end then, it, it, you see the triumph of Jesus Christ. And uh, I want to go to uh, Psalm 22, 22. That ought to be easy to remember. 
So we know how it begins, and it's quoted there in Matthew. But I want to go to 22, 22 of that psalm. And uh, here we see, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. So here Jesus is speaking as the head of the church. We're his brothers. And I want to go now to the book of Hebrews, uh, the second chapter and the 12th verse. Hebrews 2 and verse 12. Uh, let's go to the 11th verse. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. I could almost break down and cry. Jesus Christ is not ashamed to call me and you, you know, brethren. Saying, verse 12, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. You know, so... The psalm is one of agony, but also of, of victory. He quotes it here. And so uh, here we see the, uh, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Uh, we see the, the fact that he was forsaken, at, you know, and, and so he, he gave his life for us, as we understand, that we might live. He took upon himself the, the penalty of death so that we might not have eternal death as a penalty uh, for us. And it's also interesting when he said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. You know, by the way, sabachthani is Aramaic. Uh, the Hebrew is, is a different verb. But, you know, he spoke what we might call Judeo-Aramaic as a conversational language. And um, some of those who stood there, uh, when they heard that, said, excuse me, said, this man is, is calling for Elijah, Eliyahu. They heard him saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, and they thought he was calling for Eliyahu. But that's interesting, because Eliyahu is going to come before the second coming of Christ. Not the literal Elijah, but one in the spirit and power of Elijah. I believe the first of the two witnesses is what I believe that's talking about, but uh, it will come before the second coming of Christ. So here we have the sacrifice of Christ. We have we have uh, forgiveness, salvation, Christian living, and there, then now we're reminded about what made it all possible, the sacrifice of Christ. And now we go to Mark 13, sorry, Mark uh, 15 and verse 34. Uh, and here in Mark 13, 34, and at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi. This is more uh, more Aramaicized than the, uh, than the Matthew quote. Lama sabachthani which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of those who stood by when they heard that said, look, he's calling for Elijah. Now, we see that the quotation is different in Mark from Matthew. And I think this gives us a lesson about quotations in the Bible. The quotations in the Bible are for us to understand what the person said in terms of what he meant. It doesn't have to be ipsissima verba. It doesn't have to be a tape recording. It's letting us know what we need to know about what he said. And now it becomes canonized scripture. You know, and this, so this is what we need to know about what he said. It doesn't necessarily have to be word for word a recording of what he said. This is how I believe anyway. So we now have those statements, <coughs> pardon me, which is the fourth statement uh, of, of Jesus Christ. And now I want to go to, uh, to the book of John. And uh, we were already, uh, well, I don't know if we were there before. I guess we were there before. Yes, and I want to go back there. So I want to go back to uh, John 19 and um, verse 28, all right? Uh, John 19, verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. And uh, they're referring us here to Psalm 2215. Uh, I'll take a look at that. I had another one in mind, but uh, I'll look at this one. Uh, Psalm 22 and verse 15. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the, to the dust of death. Well, that's just certainly apply when he says, I thirst. But I want to go to a literal fulfillment of that, a literal uh, antitype 
um, or uh, I'm sorry, a literal type before the antitype, a literal prophecy about it, and that's in Psalm 69 and verse 21. Psalm 69. And verse 21, they also gave me gall for my food, and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. So Jesus really wasn't given, you know, proper provisions when they when they when they arrested him and tortured him. He just got bitterness, you know. He wasn't fed, and then when he was thirsty, he said, "I thirst." They they offered him vinegar, you know. So uh, he was again fulfilling a prophecy here, and so he said. I'm going to go back now to John 19:28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it, put it, put it on hyssop, and put it in uh, it to his mouth. So here we see, again, not only did he die, he didn't just drop dead, he suffered. He suffered every kind of penalty on our behalf as well. You know, by his stripes we're healed. We, we, there's no penalty that uh, we might have incurred that he didn't suffer. And so he not only died, but he suffered and died. And that is, that is mentioned here when he says, I thirst. It's a summary of that. And uh, then we see that, uh, we, so, so we, we, see, we see forgiveness, we see salvation, we see Christ, Christian living, uh, we see the, his, his giving of his life, and now we see the, the, uh, the uh, suffering that he went through uh, and, uh, for us. He, the, in other words, the blood and the body, you might say. Uh, and, and, and now, he, uh, in verse 30, so when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. So his final uh, word here is, it is finished. So he has successfully accomplished his mission on earth. And so this is really a, a, uh, a statement of triumph. He has, he has done the job. You know, so we have, we have forgiveness, we have salvation, we have Christian living, we have the sacrifice of Christ of his life, the sacrifice of, 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 his, of his body, and then we have his triumph, his success in doing all of that for us. And then we go back to uh, Luke uh, 23. Let me go first to Psalm 31. Uh, Psalm 31, and I want to go to the fifth verse of Psalm 31. This has had a very big influence, by the way, on, on Jewish liturgy. Um, Psalm 22 has as well in, in a, a different verse than one I quoted today but I want to go to Psalm 31 and verse 5 uh, Psalm 31 5 into your hand I commit my spirit you have redeemed me O eternal God of truth and so uh, he finishes with the first part of this verse you know Jesus Christ now is going to has done what he had to do, so he go, he ascends now, uh, in effect, uh, to, uh, let's put it this way, his spirit leaves, you know, because the spirit goes back to God who gave it, but he's now dead, the man is dead, and um, the man will be dead for, for, you know, and in the tomb, but the next step, of course, is because he completed the job successfully, the next step is the resurrection, and that resurrection will be to spirit life, so at this point, he has a spirit in man, as all human beings do, and this power that we have to be fully human returns back to God when we're dead. It, 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 just like I'm going to shut off a light, the electricity is still there, but the light is shut off. Now I'm going to turn the light back on again. So when 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 we're alive and well, you know the the electricity is we've turned the light on to turn the switch on, and then we shut it off uh, when we're dead, and so the power is no longer needed for us and it returns to God. Uh, so his spirit returned to God, but he knew then the next step would be his resurrection to immortal life, which was to come, uh, you know, on the first day of the week, as we know. Um, well, some, some people believe it was on, on the Sabbath. That's, a, that's a, another subject as to well, you know, whether it occurred right for, at the beginning of the week, Saturday night, or whether it occurred Sabbath afternoon. That's the subject for another 
another discussion. But in verse 5, it says, Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O eternal God of truth. So, into your hand I commit my spirit. Similar words were said by uh, by Stephen as he was martyred in Acts 7. But I want to go now to Luke 23. <clears throat> and um, verse 46, okay? Luke 23, 46. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. So that was his final uh, statement. And that was a statement indicating confidence in, in the fact that his spirit will return to God. And of course, God was going to resurrect him uh, to immortal life. You know, so this we could call this, you know, this final statement confidence. Uh, in, in, in God's plan of salvation. So we have, uh, we have the theme of forgiveness, of salvation. We have the theme of relationships, of Christian living. We have the uh, sacrifice of Christ's life, sacrifice of his body, the successful completion of his mission, his triumph, and then his confidence uh, in, 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 that God would then, uh, would then resurrect him uh, to uh, immortal life. So these are these are seven sayings at the conclusion of of Jesus' ministry, which we can take to heart, which we can study and develop various themes. I hope that the themes I've developed from these statements have been helpful and useful and are, are appropriate to 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 what was to what these scriptures are telling us, and uh, that that it will give you positive food for thought as we approach this very solemn season of the year, very special season. And the Jews do call the season of the days when they read Zaman Chirutenu, the time of our freedom. It is, it is a time when we can think in terms of freedom in many different ways. Um, I'd like to go now to 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. And in the 21st verse, we see a summary of what we're going to be uh, commemorating on the night of the New Testament Passover on the Lord's Supper, what we're commemorating. Verse 21 of uh, 2 Corinthians 5. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Because we have the Holy Spirit of God, Jesus Christ is living his life uh, again in us now we're imperfectly doing it but uh, God has made it possible and we can be very grateful for that and we can be grateful that our Savior who died for us is our eternally living Savior Savior and so we can go to the verse right before I go as a minister of Jesus Christ to the preceding verse now then we are ambassadors for Christ so we in the ministry we have the role of ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So as a minister of Jesus Christ, having gone over what he said before his death, knowing that he was resurrected to immortal life and is our living savior, uh, I encourage all of us to draw closer to God as we approach this very special season of the year. And certainly we hope and pray that all of you will be well, will be healthy during this time of the year. All the best to you and yours.